we looked at the reinvention of Bhangra several times before its present contemporary reinvention in the mid 80s and the 90s. Uh, I'll quickly summarize uh, what we discussed in the previous session about the 1947 uh, marginalized Punjabi dance genre was privileged over Jhumar and co-opted in the production of Punjabi regional identity. In 85, this was hybridized with Western pop beats and appropriated in the production of British Asian identity. And at the simultaneously, it was being modernized in the pro consolidation of Punjabi regional identity. And in the 90s, it's important in the production of a transnational Punjabi identity. Now, um, uh, in the uh, early 90s, it returns back to India on the wave of new communication technologies, liberalization of the economy and privatization of the skies through MTV and also by ETC Punjabi. And the two um, leading figures in this reinvention were in the 90s were Apache Indian from UK and the Lair Mendi from India. Uh, today, I'm going to look at, uh, in this particular unit, I'm going to look at how the new technologies and media, which we uh, said were enablers of globalization, have played a significant role in Bhangra's transformation, uh, its reinventions over the years. Let's look at some of, let's, uh, let's look at how the technologies have import, uh, impacted Bhangra and how they have led to um, the transformation of Bhangra. Uh, as we said, uh, when we look at Punjabi folk dance in the global village, uh, while the switch over to new media and technologies definitely altered the Indian cultural landscape in a variety of ways, the changes they assured were entirely different from those predicted by globophobes. Globophobes are people who feared globalization and technophobes who are afraid of technologies. New media and communication technologies together with deregulation and liberalization have significantly altered Bhangra's form and content, released musical production and distribution from state control and led to a vernacular autonomy, which I spoke about earlier when I said that globalization and new media and technologies have also been emancipatory in terms of unsettling intranational hegemonies. And uh, in this case, the emergence of a vernacular auto autonomy uh, in the case of Bhangra. But it's not, it's not an unmixed blessing because at the same time, it's subjected to new capitalist structures of domination. So, when we look at Bhangra's reinvention in uh, relation to the theories of media that we've been talking about earlier, we see that when it transforms from Punjabi harvest dance to global dance music, it moves from a live to live face to face performance to electronic electronically mediated production. And Ong's distinction between primary and secondary orality is very relevant here, as is McLuhan's transformation theory of media and Raymond Williams' notion of symptomatic technologies. So as uh, critiquing the techno-deterministic determinism theory, William Satya, he, when he says that he considers particular technologies or a complex of technologies as symptoms of a change of some kind and relates causes and effects to use by asserting that technologies are uh, take place within a social context. So when we look at Bhangra and this obsession with purity of Bhangra and the origins of Bhangra against with hybrid mutants of Bhangra compared, we find that the search for origins in Bhangra leads to its valorization as the non-technologized sound of the pre-industrial non-West and mediation becomes a major determinant of purity and authenticity. So it's the techno nostalgia which leads to a search for origins and for so-called pure forms of Bhangra. 
Ethnomusicologists attempt to locate Bhangra in another time, in, an, in addition to another place, reflects the nostalgia for, for the pre-industrial past in post-industrial societies. So, one reason for the revival of Bhangra or for the uh, exoticization and the popularization of Bhangra in the West could be this nostalgia for a pre-industrial past in post-industrial society, which elevates the rustic music of uh, peasants and cultivators to the status of global dance music. Ethnomusicologists would restore it to its originary face-to-face -face context uh, with the performance governed by the rules of performance and use it to assess all future corruptions. Now, this is, uh, this is the case with what is happening with Bhangra. There is a search for the original form, which we found yes in the previous session that there was no original form or if there was an original form, it is lost, its origins are lost. We do not know how, what that form looked like except in the bodies of the Bazigars and the performing communities. We do not know what that original genre was like, because what we have, the documentation we have is that of the uh, a form, which was already mixed through uh, amalgamation of various Punjabi dance genre, genres in the invention of what the modern form of Bhangra is. And these primary uh, oral contexts are compared with the uh, secondary context of secondary or orality, which is already contaminated with literacy. And the most recent, so if we look at Bhangra's transformation, the contemporary transformation in against the back, background of these series of transformations that have occurred in its history, we will see that the most recent transformation in Bhagra history, uh, like other transformations, has been revealed to be conditioned by socio-political causes rather than technologies. It is now agreed that the forming of boundaries of the, after the partition of India and of Punjab and displacement was one of the reasons that neglected to the uh, contributed to the neglect of pan Punjabi cultural genres. Uh, the partition of uh, Punjab and the closure of boundaries uh, displaced the hereditary performers, because performers who used to roam freely between the boundaries of not just uh, in, in, uh, in undivided India, but, but across the boundaries of Al Hind. Now, uh, found themselves being restricted by the coming up of borders. Not, uh, it was not possible when it was not possible for them to uh, roam around, to wander across the boundaries, across the boundaries, uh, boundaries. Practitioners of genres which originated in the western part of Punjab could uh, could not travel to the in East Punjab, the other part of Punjab, and. As a, re as a result, the genres which had emerged in the western part were marginalized in the new uh, Indian Punjab after 1947 and led to the marginalization of Jhumar to a new, new, newly produced form of Bhangra. Alka Pan Pandey attributes the marginalization or transformations to modernity and industrialization and Gib Schreffler, the American ethnomusicologist, attributes it to the collapse of feudal patronage system. We will find in the case of Bhangra that all these factors, modernity and industrialization, closure of boundaries and the collapse of feudal patronage systems contributed to the transformation of Bhangra and other folk genres. So, uh, as uh, we have already found that this attempt to uh, close uh, Bhangra, to, uh, to fix the boundaries of music, have affected its uh, uh, pr production and its transformation. So, if we were to compare pr primary orality with commercial productions of Bhangra, we will find that uh, there is an attempt among ethnomusicologists to produce authenticity, to elevate or to privilege the so-called authentic or pure forms over the hybrid forms.
This search for origins and the cult of authenticity leads purists and ethnomusicologists to search for the origins of Bhangra and one search, some such search leads to the original performance context of Bhangras, which were Melas, Chins and Akharas. These were the contexts in which Bhangra was performed and not, not staged. The staging of Bhangra, this artificial staging of Bhangra with the consequent division be between the performer and audience was a later development. At the same time, we have the production of Jhumar, uh, not only Bhangra, but Jhumar, uh, the revival of Jhumar in, uh, in at the turn of the, sen uh, turn of the century was largely through the efforts of one sole practitioner of Jhumar uh, called Pokhar Singh, who lived in a border village and trained the youth of that village to uh, in, in the movements of Jhumar, which was almost on the verge of extinction in, in India, on, in, in Eastern Punjab, in the Indian Punjab. And largely due to Pokhar Singh's efforts, the, the, the Jhumar form, which was a more dominant form in undivided Punjab, has been resurrected. But then we look at, if we look at these res resurrection of Jhumar, which happened largely through, uh, of course, it had been preserved, lovingly preserved by Pokhar Singh by training the youth of his village in this uh, nearly extinct form uh, through, uh, through, ironically, once again, a Punjabi film called Jiyayanu, in which Jomar was performed. And ever since, not only Bhangra, but in the same way as Bhangra was staged in school, college functions, and in Bhangra competition, Jumar is now being performed not only in Punjab, but in functions in Punjabi diasporas, including the international Bhangra competitions. But what is the problem with Pokhar Singh's Bhangra? Uh, sorry, Pokhar Singh's Jumar. We found an example of Jumar in, uh, in um, the Mekoi Jhut Bolya uh, number in Jagti Raho with Manohar Deepak performing the gentle, graceful, fluid movements of Jhumar, which are very different from that of Bhangra. But uh, apparently, when uh, ethnomusicologists such as Shreffler went to collect samples of Jhumar and went to consult Pokhar Singh, uh, they found that uh, the Pokhar Singh was a teenager when uh, the last Jhumar was performed. Uh, 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 the, the story is that it was performed before Pandit Nehru and the members who performed uh, were included Pokhar Singh's mother, largely by female dancers of the, of the performing community. Now, when, uh, when, when the ethnomusicologists ethno ethno tried to uh, consult Pokhar Singh on what the original Jhumar looked like. He did not, uh, the, the voices of the women who were, now mid, who were now in the middle age were not, were silenced and it was Pokhar Singh's version of Pankara, his understanding of Jhumar that dominated the voices of all other performers in the group. So what we have today what we have in the present as what is called, what has come to be known as Jhumar is again like uh, Tsunami's Bhangra, we have Okar Singh's uh, Jhumar, which has now become a global, dan global Bhangra genre, a global dance genre. Now, we find that primary orality, as Song called it, has been complicated through the presence of secondary orality. Except for hereditary performers, few Bhangra practitioners would claim the privileged position of primary orality through spontaneous composition. Even traditional performance cannot be viewed in isolation from the impact of secondary orality, where through the mediated image and electronic reproduction, uh, Bhangra has been uh, impacted. Hereditary performers have a choice between the anthropologizing gaze of the ethnomusicologist 
recording unmediated performance to establish its purity or the reifying machinery of the cultural industry in which purity becomes a source of added value. So, uh, the, the hereditary performers have a choice either to uh, be anthropologized by ethnomusicologists who do not want to record mediated performances to record uh, pure performances in face to face performance context. On the other hand, we also have a culture industry which seems to reify and the cul uh, reify uh, pure performance, uh, catering, pandering or capitalizi capitalizing on the cult of authenticity and purity which has emerged in uh, uh, post-industrial West, craving for the culture and the purity of pre technologized music. So, while performance primary performance context might be already contaminated through the presence of technologies as we saw that we do not have any uh, documentation and the moment one tries to document a form it becomes mediated, it becomes contaminated, it becomes an object of secondary orality rather than primary orality. Through the presence of technologies secondary or mediated performance might be employed in the performance of rusticity or ritual. Now, this is very important. The distinction between primary orality and uh, secondary orality between face to face performance and electronically mediated performance has, bec has uh, become redundant or has become more complicated than on good let us have, because uh, we find recorded music being played not only in the, uh, not, not only in entertainment, but in even in sacred con context or in the performance of rituals, whether it is a, a wedding uh, uh, or it is any other birth related cere ceremony wherever Bhangra is performed, one finds that uh, are uh, sometimes only recorded music is played, recordings of, uh, of uh, original Bhangra performances are played or uh, after token uh, live performances by folk singers or folk dancers, we people or uh, the, the party or the, the celebrations or the rituals. Uh, switch over to recorded music. Musical authenticity therefore, is contingent upon its discovery by the aristocratic or middle class patrons and legitimized by official and semi official institutions. The particular musical narrative produced by the new trade patrons of traditional music could be privileged over others as authentic translations of tradition as we saw in the case of Bhangara. It was the particular musical narrative produced by the Maharaja of Patiala in, con, uh, in collaboration with state uh, officials and hereditary performers that has been privileged over what could, what we, we do not know what was an authentic translation of tradition. So, before I go to the Bhangra performance per se, uh, I would like to trace its prehistory eh, of, uh, of the contemporary Bhangra music genre in, in the birth of what was known as folk song following the uh, European uh, classification of music as folk and classical music. And this the electronic uh, mediation of uh, folk music began with the uh, setting up of uh, during the gramophone era and um, it was the recording and dissemination technologies that contributed to the displacement of the feudal patronage by state patronage to a certain extent thereby altering the relation between performers and patrons. So, the gramophone era, the gramophone uh, signals this shift of patronage systems from feudal patronage to state patronage or commercial 
patronage which altered the relation between performers and patrons. Now, regular Qureshi has spoken not in the case of Bhangra, but in the case of Kavali, a hegemonic alliance between recording companies, dissemination media and patrons in the gramophone era in India, in which centralized state control media like radio disseminated music produced by a monopolistic record industry. So, the first stage is the recording of uh, folk music by a monopolist com record industry, uh, large mainly the gramophone company of India and the same productions were disseminated over the ra radio uh, to the masses. Now, the gramophone uh, company of India's records show that between 1908 and 1916, it recorded secular musical kafis, mainly of Bulesha, some Kavalis and Gittas in secular music and in the category of spiritual music, it recorded Sikh spiritual mu music. Uh, with the means of dissemination under state control, in the colonial and post-colonial era and their dependence on a monopolistic recording industry, we must remember that production of music as well as dissemination of music was centralized and controlled by a small taste group in metro metropolitan centers. So, the Gramophone India, um, Company of India or All India Radio disseminated or produced the music that had a uh, that was uh, that that had uh, listeners that was appreciated by a small taste group in metro metropolitan centers, namely the Hindi Urdu elite of non uh, of North India, and this was the music which was also uh, disseminated after the independence of India by the post-colonial Indian state on All India Radio. Now, during the radio age, the radio age. Uh, did democratize cultural production, notwithstanding the notwithstanding the misgivings of Frankfurt theor school theorists like Adorno, by making production available to the masses for a fraction of the cost. Because during the gramophone era, gram uh, gramophone uh, was expensive, and the listening to music recorded. Uh, on LPs, long playing records, was uh, restricted to the to a, a very small elite group within India. With the All India Radio during the radio age, this music was disseminated to the became available to the masses. Uh, the, but the radio e age, the radio also continued to play the role of the custodian of high class classical music. All India Radio did subvert feudal patriarchal domination in th uh, and also expressed a pre preference for urban professionals over hereditary performers. Now, the switch from hereditary performers as we noted earlier in the case of uh, dance as well as in this case of music by displacing hereditary uh, performers who were stigmatized because of their association with certain professions which uh, were um, uh, which were uh, which offended purist Victorian uh, morality were displaced and marginalized and the function the responsibility of cultural preservation was now given to urban professionals, several of them who were several of whom were middle class urban professionals through the uh, through the birth of the professional performer, the professional dancer as well as the professional singer. Now, in the case of uh, we will not talk about uh, the professional performers in the rest of India, we will confine ourselves to Punjab because as it pertains to the later hybridization and transformation of Bhangra in the UK and the transformation of Bhangra from dance to music through the mixing of folk song with folk music. Um, uh, the first professional performer uh, 
we will not look at the gramophone era, which does have the recordings of some hereditary performers, including the stigmatized uh, courtesans uh, and also uh, some uh, celebrated practitioners of the Kafi and the Sufiana Kalam. Um, we come to the radio era and the birth of the professional radio singer with the Core Sisters. The first uh, All India Radio, which is a private company initially set up by the British in the 1930s. By 1940s, it had a center in, uh, it had a very important center uh, in, uh, in Lahore. And uh, All India Radio Lahore uh, introduce uh, the, the Kaur sisters, first Prakash Kaur, who belonged to middle class, who had a middle class background, who became the singing stars of the All India Radio in the 1940s. Uh, the Kaur sisters largely uh, uh, sang Punjabi folk music but they transformed folk music to fit into the radio format. Now, as opposed to the traditional folk music, the folk song or the geet in Punjab, which was, which largely consisted of calls and responses, uh, such as the, as we call the Bhangra Bolis, the calls and responses, which would consist of a nonsense formula and uh, a response, which would be uh, which would be again, uh, which would vary, uh, which would rhyme with the formulae call. Now, Kaur, the core sisters altered this, uh, uh, altered the structure of the folk song or geet by, uh, by using, uh, by improvising on traditional formulae, inventing new formulae and also improvising on new form formulae. To, uh, to offer individual productions which fitted into the radio format, the three mi minute radio song format. And those hereditary practitioners who were not able to conform or adapt to the requirements of the new media were not preferred by All India Radio. So, Surinder Kaur, who is con considered the, uh, the, the four um, mother or of, uh, of Bhangra, was acknowledged as the founding, as a founding figure in the history of Punjabi folk music, uh, ha, came from a middle class family. Uh, she was a teenager when she was discovered by All India Radio and initially she performed along with her sister Prakash Kaur, who died very young. Now, this destabilized, this led to the destabilization of class, gender, caste categories. It also altered, led to the alteration of patronage systems and traditional performance etiquette. Because as in the, unlike in the past, where Mirasis, the performing caste of Mirasis performed for upper caste landowners and royalty, now we had middle class performers and that led to the transformation of the genre, not only a combination of the loss of change in patronage systems as well as the requirements of the new medium altered the geet beyond recognition. Now, core's ability to adjust their co compositions to the record requirements of the recording medium to innovations in folk music, they introduce original uh, folk compositions in the folk style by expanding the boli to fit the record and radio format. And its presentation was patterned on classical or filmy singing rather than folk singing. The presentation changed and we also find an intrusion of orchestra and western instruments. Before we close, uh, I would uh, like to play to you some samples from the legendary singers albums quickly. Uh,
So, I am going to play to you a very iconic song by Surinder Kaur. Some of the iconic songs by Surinder Kaur, these are the two sisters Surinder Kaur and Prakash Kaur and this song the, which has now entered the folk repertoire, Lathe Di Chadar, Utte Sileti Rangmaya is a song which was uh, which is an individual composition. Most of us who have heard, we who have grown up listening to this song and heard it at weddings and other performances did not were not aware that this was not folk song. It was a composition by the uh, the, the two sisters, and it's a revo in the in a reversal. The folk song, the individual composition by the two sisters, entered the repertoire of the Punjabi. So, uh, the radio era, let us conclude with the radio era. In the 1950s, the setting up of the All India Radio, which set up units for collection and preservation of folk music at 20 stations, began to air Punjabi folk music, and thus was born the category of the popular singer and the popular singer ever played an important role in the construction of a post-independent Punjabi identity and the radio served as McLuhan says as the tribal drum. Radio artist's absorption into the folk canon is related to the sub subliminal depths of radio being charged with the resonating echoes of tribal horns and antique drums and it is uh, what McLuhan called the hot medium. It and appeal to the oral sensorium. Uh, we've, we have already talked about film, how film serves as a sole visual do documentation of Bhangra and the first uh, dream. I do not need to repeat this because we have already talked about the film. We will move on to the Doordarshan, the television era. As I said earlier while talking about Bhangra's reinvention, Gurdas Man's performance at the New Year Eve program in 1980. Uh, which was which transformed both the Geet as well as the Nrit, both Punjabi folk song and Punjabi folk dance uh, through marrying of through marrying song and dance with lyrics, and this helped to modernize Bhangra and also resulted in the birth of the urban professional Bhangra performer. Now, this uh, urban professional Bhangra performer, unlike the archaeized folk artist of Nayadar, we must remember that even the Deepak brothers were middle class performers, who they, although they were trained by Banaram Tsunami, they were the first professional performers of Bhangra. But Gurdas Man must be given the credit of reinventing Bhangra, unlike the Deepak brothers who, uh, who, who essayed traditional moves. Unlike them, Bhangra was reinvented by, uh, by Gurdas Man who married song with dance and what he produced. Let us take a quick look at the genre that he produced and we have fortunately th this recording of his first performance. <laughs> Okay. So, as you can see that Bhangra has already altered uh, a new genre is bo born which is not the dance 
but is a uh, marriage of dance with song and dance. And uh, simultaneously, we also find that music geet is being produced at, uh, in Punjab. And this, uh, these uh, musical productions of uh, folk music outside the hegemony of All India Radio, which recorded, which had it own, its own list of artists. With the coming of the cassette culture, the uh, Punjabi musical production, regional music production broke out of this monopoly of All India Radio and certain music companies uh, through the availability of uh, cheaply produced pro uh, cassettes, uh, which were uh, which were produced by a new company called T-Series, a company which uh, cashed in on the niche market for regional folk music, which was enjoyed by a number of people in India, but was not produced or marketed by the, uh, the musical giants like HMB Saregama. And this new entrant began to produce uh, music of uh, regional stars who used to give live performances. And one of the stars was uh, a singer called Amar Singh Ch Chamkila, whose lyrics, uh, who was an ex Im immensely talented singer called Amar Singh Ch Chamkila, whose uh, lyrics uh, demonstrated verbal play, puns, lyrical complexities, but who was unfortunately also his innuendos and his puns made him the target of terrorists uh, during the terrorist movement in Punjab, and he was shot down. Now, it is these albums, these uh, cheaply produced cassettes, which found their way into the diasporas, as diasporic Punjabis returning home would carry home, carry back these albums, these cassettes of uh, singers from Punjab uh, to their homes. And these were the songs which their kids, like uh, Apache Indian, grew up listening to. So we conclude with uh, the satellite technologies and the impact on uh, uh, satellite te technologies, MTV, and music video, and their impact on the production of Bhangra, as well as its transformation. So with the music video, as opposed to Doordarshan television, there's a dif difference in the format of Bhangra dancing. We saw Gurdas Man performing on Doordarshan Live, which was a very different kind of performance from what one sees in the music video, because uh, now the new music videos, the Bhangra music videos, demonstrate a primacy of the visual over the oral. And they invariably use the MTV format of the music video. And this music, the cult of the music video is best perform uh, represented by the by another pioneer of Bhangra, uh, the pioneer of Bhangra pop or Punjabi pop called the Lair Mehendi, uh, which again led to a different kind of globalization of Bhangra, not through, uh, through its uh, diasporization in the US, UK, but through its transformation or modernization in India, in which the Vilati was, uh, with, was mixed with Desi. Let us listen to the Lair Mehendi. Uh, once again, we have the Lair Mehendi's first album, which, which I said sold a million copies in the state of the southern state of Kerala and made that that is it's now history. So this is the first time that a non-film music gave a run for its money to Bollywood music, which had so far dominated musical production as well as as well as um, uh, uh, reception. But uh, please ignore the lyrics, because this is a translation uh, trans uh, subtitles, which have been given by someone who obviously doesn't understand it in Punjabi. But uh, this is the first time we have, unlike Gurdas Man, who had an extremely telegenic personality, we have this very pleasantly plump figure of the Lair Mehendi performing and his video becoming a, a hit within India, nationalizing music uh, Bhangra and also leading to its globalization subsequently. 
And now well, let's look at how this Bhangra was globalized. Let's look at some examples of Bhangra being globalized and uh, performers dancing to Bhangra in uh, Dalir Mendi's Bhangra. A few samples, a few uh, quick samples of how. I would like to play a white, uh, white audience playing to Bolo Tararara. So you can say it's not just the Bhangra produced in the UK, but also produced in India, which is now being, uh, which is found audience across the world. With this, we uh, conclude the section on the uh, glo uh, on the transformations in the content of Bhangra and in the genre of Bhangra to the mediation of electronic technologies, and how the myth of pur purity is. Uh, is a myth which cannot really be sustained in view of the frequent reinventions and transformations of Bhangra.